Mesa, greetings, members and friends of Theravada Buddhist Council of Malaysia. Theravada Buddhists believe that 2,657 years ago, our Buddha Gautama attained Parinibbana on a full moon day of Vesakha, just like today. It is so called because the Indian astronomical constellation Visakha aligns with the full moon on such a day. Theravada Buddhists also believe that 80 years earlier he was born as Siddhartha Gautama, also on the full moon day of Vesakha, and at the age of 35 he attained supreme awakening again on the full moon day of Vesakha. Now, this chronology cannot be found in the Pali Canon. In fact, modern Buddhist scholars, historians and archaeologists are still debating over the exact dates of these events. Nonetheless, the exact dates don't really matter, do they? The most important thing is what the Buddha taught because many of his teachings can still be very relevant today even two and a half millennia after he had passed away. You will be surprised to know that according to our Pali canonical records, the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. Aha, uh -huh. surprise? He taught the Dhamma Vinaya. Eventually, what the Buddha taught was made into a thriving religion called Buddhism, with many schools, sects, traditions and lineages, each with different interpretations, practices, ceremonies, rites and rituals. To someone who is looking for the essence of what the Buddha taught, this indeed is very confusing. But if we strip away all these ideological and cultural differences, we are left with the core teachings of the Buddha which are based on one single principle. And what is that? Conditionality, cause and effect. Even his central teachings of the Four Noble Truths is based on this principle, is an expression of this principle. The First Noble Truth of suffering is caused by craving, desire, attachment, which is the second noble truth. The third noble truth is the cessation of suffering, which is the result of following the noble evil path, the fourth noble truth. Now you might say, well, didn't the Buddha prescribe the four noble truths for the complete cessation of all samsaric sufferings? Uh, yes, indeed he did. But suffering can be progressively reduced. Suffering can progressively cease according to one's level of awakening. For instance, during the Buddha's time, the non-renunciants attained the first stage of awakening and therefore became stream enterers while they were listening to the Buddha explaining the Four Noble Truths. This shows that the Four Noble Truths are particularly relevant to lay people. Indeed, the Four Noble Truths can be applied to our daily lives to help reduce our mind-rooted suffering and increase happiness and contentment. And believe it or not, the good news is that you can even do this without having to attend a meditation retreat. How? Very simple. Just ask yourself, one simple question. Why? Whenever you suffer. Which means to say, when you feel angry, upset, disappointed, frustrated, sad, these are the times when you are suffering. And when you ask yourself why, invariably you will find that it is due to unfulfilled desire, frustrated ones. Desire for objects of the senses that bring you pleasure, 
attachment to expectations of how people should behave, how you should perform, how things should be. Attachment to views, ideas, opinions, and so forth. The more often you are able to see this link between suffering and the cause of suffering, which is desire and attachment, then you will automatically reduce your desires. Consequently, you will have less suffering and more happiness and contentment. Now, the Buddha's teaching on the first and second noble truth, suffering and its cause, is something very universal. Because the reduction of suffering and the pursuit of happiness and contentment is a universal quest, regardless of race, nationality, religion, creed, age, or gender. Now, you might think that the first and second noble truth, suffering and its cause, seem to be very obvious, don't they? They are very obvious and very simple. And yet, it took a Samasam Buddha to rediscover this natural law and share it with us out of great compassion. For this, we are eternally grateful to the Buddha and therefore, today, on this full moon day of Vesa, we honor the Buddha by commemorating his birth, supreme awakening and final passing away. And there are many ways of honoring the Buddha. There are some popular ways like bathing the baby bodhisattva as a symbolic gesture of cleansing the defilements, offering flowers and incense, participating in the great effort to create a beautiful float for the Vesa night procession, lighting lamps and lights at night, singing hymns in praise of the Buddha, chanting and recollecting the Buddha's virtues, and so forth. No doubt, all of these are valid ways of honouring the Buddha. But the Buddha himself said, just before he passed away, that of all these ways of honouring me, the highest form of honour is by practising the Dhamma accordingly. So even if you have done any of these things that I just mentioned, I hope you will also include this highest form of Buddha Puja by trying to verify for yourself the first and second noble truth. In this way, not only will you have honoured the Buddha, but you will also have reduced your suffering and improved the quality of your life and all those around you. So, I wish all of you a mindful and happy Vesak.